Hello, uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Travis Newhouse. I'm the chief architect at Upformix, and I'm joined by my colleague, Harshit Jatalia, who leads the integration of our product with OpenStack and Docker. And Appformix provides software to control and monitor the resource usage in your infrastructure. And today, what I'm going to talk about is after you've set up your infrastructure and deployed your applications, how, as an application owner, do you ensure the expected performance of your applications? And as an infrastructure operator, how are you able to maximize the value of your infrastructure? So after you have OpenStack or Docker Engine up and running, um, you have this ability to easily create with a few mouse clicks, a few keystrokes, an instance, and start an application inside your infrastructure. Um, and this is awesome, because it's very simple. You can just spawn things off, and you're off and running. Okay? And as soon as people find out about this in your organization, they're very happy. They come to you and they say, I need an instance. And so you spawn them one, you give them a virtual machine or a container, and they deploy their application to it. And everyone's very happy. You start running applications, right? And where are these applications running? The applications are running on shared infrastructure. So every time you spawn a new instance, the slice of the pie is shrinking for each of those applications. Now, in some cases, that's OK. And you actually want that. You want to maximize how much utilization you get out of that hardware you've invested in. But there are other cases where it could eventually lead to applications not receiving the amount of resources they expect to achieve the performance they desire. And in the simplest case, what can happen is that the application, there's just too many running on the same host. And so the amount of resources that are available to a particular application are just too small and the user experience degrades because there aren't enough resources to do what the application wants. Um, the application developer has tested his code. He's implemented it in a scalable fashion. He's made sure that he's done his load testing. But when he gets it into production and it runs on shared infrastructure, all bets are off because he doesn't know how much resources he's going to get to run his application. Um, the second kind of problem that can arise is actually what I would call dynamic demand for resources. On that shared infrastructure, it's not always a constant demand for resources by the applications. You know, workload comes and go, requests from users come and go, and the amount of resources that a particular application uses is going to change over time. And as it changes over time, the availability of resources changes over time to all the virtual machines or the containers running on a particular host. And what that leads to is this unpredictable performance. So in contrast with just not being able to get an absolute amount that you need to run uh, acceptably, you can run into a different problem where the unpredictability is what you'll get complaints about. Right? Sometimes the application is running great. Sometimes now the user experience is, is poor. And so how do you deal with that unpredictability? I'm going to give a little example here. Um, what you can see on this user interface is that um, this is showing the view of a single host that is hosting uh, six virtual machines. And uh, we're displaying the amount of CPU, the amount of memory, and the network I.O. in and out of the physical server associated with each virtual machine on that box. Um, now, when the application is not getting the right performance, when the application owner gets a complaint that the performance is, is not ex meeting the expectations, he's going to start asking, why is it happening? Right? And the infrastructure operator will typically look at the connectivity. He'll check that the packet and byte counters are going up. He'll see that the uh, application is getting scheduled. He'll see that it's running, and he'll say, you know, from my end, it looks fine. The infrastructure is doing what it's supposed to do. Your application is running. But the application owner knows that he's not getting the user experience that he expects. And we need these monitoring tools to help identify where is the bottleneck happening. Um, and in this case, with the right tools, what we can see is that as the number of instances grew, 
maybe this application in yellow at the bottom, it keeps shrinking, right? It gets down to the point where it's either below an acceptable threshold of resources, or as the demand varies because the blue uh, application has a kind of varying load, that sometimes the application in yellow is running well, and sometimes it's not. And so this leads to kind of the first thing that what we at Performix provide, which is real-time monitoring, right? And it has a few aspects. Um, first is just to give visibility into what the problem is in real time. So we want to give you fine-grained resources, or fine-grained view of your resources over uh, small time scales so that you can see bursts. Um, we also want to give you visibility at um, all the resources that an application might be using. So the CPU, the memory, the disk, and the network. Um, and that's important because then using that information, you can correlate problems. Like if you see spikes in CPU at the same time, you see a uh, spike in network. Maybe that lets you identify what kind of problem uh, your application is experiencing. Maybe the uh, latency is going up as the CPU spikes because of the demand of CPU by a different application running on the same host. Um, and then the third thing that we require in the real-time monitoring is that the ability to see how the resources are used across the different layers of your infrastructure. So you want to know how much resources are being used at the host, the physical host. You also want to know how much resources are being used, when I say the physical host, I mean how much total CPU, total network, so that you can kind of see how much capacity there is. Um, you also want to know how much a particular VM or container is using. And that lets you know if this application is getting what it needs to um, achieve the expectations that you, the requirements you have for its performance. Um, and then finally, the additional thing we want to provide is application level metrics. And an example of that is for, if we look at HTTP, right? Um, so many applications these days are built um, with a service architecture and uh, you're using REST APIs to access the application. Um, and so it's very interesting to see, you know, what is the request rate? How many uh, gets versus puts versus posts are being made to an application, right? Um, that request rate is, is something that's interesting to the application developer to kind of profile their application and know why it might be performing one way or another. Um, the addition, uh, second thing is that the application owner may be curious to know if he doesn't have his own counters in, built into the application that what are the endpoints that those requests are being made to? What are the URLs that uh, those REST calls are being, um, the gets and the puts and the posts, right? So um, our, at Formix, the agent we provide, that we put for monitoring can actually provide that level of insight into the application protocol and give you uh, the ability to measure where, you know, inside the application level protocol, what's going on. Um, another interesting metric is the time to first byte. So for, an app, for a web application, for a web server, you might want to know how long does it take from the time the request arrives at the physical host, makes its way up through the virtualization layers to the application, the application processes the request and sends the first byte of response out. Right? Now that's a very useful metric because there's so many things happening between the physical network all the way up to the application. You have to worry about the scheduler, you have to worry about the packets getting through um, to the application, the data, uh, you have to wait for the application to actually do its work, um, and then you need for it to send its response back out. And all those different pieces can become a bottleneck, and it's important to be able to identify. Um, so having that metric of time to first byte lets you correlate things like compare the RTT, the round trip time, with the time to first byte, and identify is the bottleneck happening in the network because the round trip time to the network is slow, or is the bottleneck happening in the application because the network's quick and the data's arriving to the application, but it's taking a long time for the application to respond. Um, and what I've been talking about is sort of contention that happens at a single physical host, right? If you have, in the example I gave earlier, six virtual machines or six containers or hundreds of containers running on a single host, they're all fighting for the CPU on that host. They're all fighting for the network bandwidth on the physical interfaces of that host, right? But as we move towards these architectures that are based around services inside our data centers, um, where we have shared storage, where we have a shared database, or a shared identity service, the contention is now moving 
outside of the physical host, or it's actually in addition to the contention that can happen at a physical host, you can now have contention at these infrastructure services, right? So at the storage service, you may have so many requests coming from many hosts, many physical hosts, I mean, virtual instances running on many physical hosts, all asking the storage for data or sending their data, their rights to that storage service. And the bottleneck can now become at a single point in your data center that that, that, that storage service is providing or the database service. And that's why, as I mentioned earlier, the ability to see across all the hosts, all the VMs, is an important aspect to monitoring. So I'm going to show a slightly different example here. Um, what we're seeing here is a project-oriented view. So earlier I showed uh, a single host, right? And it's kind of a, easy to conceptualize the idea of many virtual machines running on a single host. And what we have here is a more logical view. So in this case, you know, there's a tenant of an OpenStack cluster. And you know, he's got a project with a couple different uh, machines running on it. And these instances, maybe instance one, two, and three are all running on a single host. Maybe that's where they got scheduled. And the client one is running on a different host. Um, but they're all accessing the same storage server. So what can happen is now, uh, if client one suddenly has a burst in demand, maybe it starts running some really large workload, starts totally reading lots and lots of data from the storage server. Suddenly, instance one, two, and three are getting a much smaller share of the storage I.O. bandwidth. Now, if you were just looking at the host that showed you the view of instance one, two, and three, you're looking at a single host, all you would see is that suddenly, instance one, instance two, instance three have reduced storage I.O. But you wouldn't be able to figure out why. Did the demand by the application go down? Or was it not able to get it, the amount of resources? But when you take a view that expands across more than one host, where you can see what's going on in your data center, maybe you can see what's going on at your storage server itself, then you can see that, OK, well, when client one suddenly spiked up, that there's some correlation there. Probably that was what's driving the problem that I have with instance one, two, and three not receiving the amount of bandwidth I wanted them to get from the storage server. So with proper monitoring, you can help pinpoint where's the bottleneck. Like when there's a performance problem, where is it happening? Why is it happening? You need these kinds of monitoring tools in order to answer those kinds of questions that, that arise uh, in, your, in, in your applications and in your infrastructure. Um, but how do you solve the problem? So if the user comes to you and says, I'm not getting enough storage I.O., my application expects a minimum requirement in order to perform at an acceptable level. What you would like to be able to do is apply a policy that says, this application is assigned this many resources so it can get its job done at an acceptable level of performance. And that is an, the second thing that AppFormix provides, is that we provide programmable control. Um, we have an API-driven um, system that you can specify the amount of resources to assign to an application or to a virtual machine or to a container. And the reason we break it down that way is that sometimes you have more than one application running inside a virtual machine, right? And maybe you want to prioritize, even within a certain virtual machine, what resources that virtual machine gets among and how they get split up among its applications. Um, maybe the virtual machine is running both a web server and a database. And maybe the database you think is a higher priority to get its data out to a storage server or an object store where it's, where it's putting its uh, information. And so you can kind of prioritize the bandwidth for the database, but maybe the, you leave the client-facing web server that's not a super high priority application, you give it a little bit less. Um, and the API that we provide is, allows you to do two things. You can both configure it in real time. So if you find a problem, you can go solve it. With a simple command, you can, with a simple uh, REST API, you can go and dynamically change the amount of resources that are given to a particular virtual machine, instance, application, what have you, that's running inside your infrastructure. Um, and you can also, you can integrate these APIs into your orchestration so that when you're creating a new virtual machine, when you're spawning up a new container, 
you can assign at that time the amount of resources that are required for that application to run. You can configure that policy, and we integrate with OpenStack. So for instance, right now, um, you have like flavors of VMs that you can have, right? Small, medium, large. And what we allow you to do is you can say, okay, for small VMs, I want this much network I.O. Or for large VMs, I want you know, such and such network I.O. and such and such CPU. Um, and providing that control allows you to you know, preemptively assign the amount of resources that you think an application is going to need, but you still have the ability at runtime to say, okay, well, I'm not seeing a problem over here. I want to, you know, I want to reconfigure my policy. I want to change it. I want to fix the problem in, as it's happening. And uh, given that application I.O. is um, such an important part of applications these days, and application I.O. is predominantly over the network now, um, we're seeing that much, much less frequently is local disk being used. I mean, IP a scratch space, but for data that matters, is going out onto the network typically. And, um, or, it's in, or applications are interacting with multiple services over, um, you know, you, you talk to your MongoDB, you talk to your Redis server, um, for, and, uh, you know, your RabbitMQ message bus. All this information is happening over the network. That's how applications and services are being composed these days. Um, so today what I want to focus on in terms of resource control is um, how you can configure the network resources to prioritize applications. Um, so just to give an example of, like, of how simple our APIs look, is that at runtime with a curl command, I can actually configure the network resource limit for, for an instance. Um, so if we, that example I gave where we had four uh, virtual machines and they were all accessing a uh, shared uh, storage server, um, we saw that the client one in purple started consuming a lot of storage I.O. And so we wanted to cut that down. And so we can, at runtime, we could say, let's say we want to cut that down to 200 megabits per second. Um, this is just a simple uh, curl command you would be able to issue to our controller that would say, for that virtual interface, this is how much bandwidth they can use. Um, similarly, if, like we were talking about, if you want to do it during orchestration, at the time you're bringing up a container, then you know, with, like, this is an example of a YAML file that we've kind of extended with Docker Compose so that uh, when you specify the container's you know, attributes, you can say, okay, for this network limit, I want to set a network limit for that container. So this video is uh, kind of continuing the example we had earlier. And we can see that the curl command was issued. The, uh, the bandwidth that's a, that the purple uh, client one is able to achieve to the storage server is now being limited to 200 megabits per second. And um, what's interesting to note here is that the total throughput in the system is not changing, right? What we're doing is we're reallocating what resources that our infrastructure does provide to meet and the requirements of our applications and to prioritize which applications are important. So the, the aggregate throughput is the same, but we've just reassigned it. Um, a second type of control that we provide is that we allow what we call a reservation. Um, and this carves out a certain amount of resources for a, a virtual machine or an interface, a virtual interface on a container, and makes it unavailable to the other instances running on that host. Um, if you recall the example we had um, in the beginning where there was varying load and the performance uh, was unpredictable because you didn't know what the demand was. The demand was always changing on that same host. So at some times, you know, a machine was able to get a lot of bandwidth. Sometimes an instance was not able to get enough bandwidth. Um, you, can, you can solve that issue by if you have an application that's a high priority, you can give it a reservation, and you can say, OK, I want to carve out this much for this application. And make sure that it receives a minimum amount of network I.O. Um, and again, API driven, and we can do it in real time. So here the yellow application is running. Um, and right now we, what we've done is we've set a 500 megabit reservation for the, app, for the yellow uh, instance 6. And what we'll see is that as the load in blue uh, comes and goes, 
that as long as there's enough demand on that Yale application, it's going to get the network I.O. that it needs to meet its performance requirements. Um, so now the blue is varying. Um, you know, the purple and pink is, they're going up and down because they're kind of subject to what's available. They haven't been given any limit or any guarantee. But yellow's been given a reservation, and so it has uh, guaranteed access to those resources on that host. So that's how we can prioritize that application and make sure it has uh, predictable performance So I um, kind of want to bring it back here is that uh, at Formix, what our goal is is to optimize cloud op op uh, operations um, by with using a, real a, tool, a software tool that provides real-time monitoring and control. Right? So the monitoring, um, I kind of showed a few aspects of what we can do with monitoring. Um, we can look at the amount of resources the physical host is using. We can look at the amount of resources that a virtual machine is using. Um, and we can inspect into what an application is doing um, in terms of you know, the protocol. Um, we have drivers right now for HTTP. Um, we, we have one for iSCSI that we're working on. So that those kind of cover a large majority of use cases that we're seeing um, in customer environments, uh, storage being a big thing that's, that's out on the network. and web services being the, the, the other. Um, so that covers like 95% you know, of things that people are doing um, that they want to monitor at the application level. Um, we, with that monitoring, we can show and help application owners and infrastructure operators identify where bottlenecks are in their infrastructure so they can find out, is, is it the application that's performing poorly? Or is it the network that's performing poorly, right? Because you have this holistic view across your whole infrastructure, you can kind of correlate and pinpoint. Um, and we feed that data up so that um, the, the, the UI that I was showing you earlier is our, our user interface. And that is completely REST-based in terms of how it controls and interacts with um, our software. Um, and it publishes the events up to the user interface, and we make that available to the users as well. So if there's custom things you would like to do with the data, um, if, there's, if there's certain monitoring you want to do, then that data can be consumed in-house by custom applications that you write um, to, to solve the kinds of problems you might be facing or to, to gain insight into what's going on in your infrastructure. Um, and we do a nice thing with that data, because there is so much data out there as you scale it up. Um, you can scale, I mean, people are, you know, data centers are growing and growing and growing. And um, our architecture is based on a distributed architecture such that um, the data that's feeding up is only the data that you really are interested in finding out about, right? So there's so much data that if you were to just push it all up and process it after it arrives at some central location, then there's just, you're going to have so much data that you won't be able to keep up with it. You'll have to do a kind of offline processing. And we want to be real time. We want to be able to show you what's going on right now in your infrastructure, right now what problems you're facing. Um, and so you, we actually flip it on its head. Instead of processing the data after it you know, arrives in some central place, we actually process it on the fly in a distributed fashion. So if you're interested in certain kinds of data that you want to subscribe to, certain kinds of events, maybe you're interested in, for instance, the time to first byte. You want to know any time the time to first byte is spiking up. Okay? You can push a query down into our system that says, when, I, when you see the time to first byte exceed one standard deviation above the norm, then I want to generate an event up. I want to know that information so that I can make a decision. I can be alerted. I could have a reactive system that is going to automatically go you know, reconfigure the policy to um, make sure that that time to first byte maybe is uh, within the requirements of the application. Um, so the second thing we do is control. And as I mentioned, it's all API driven. Um, we give you uh, real time, you can change the policy. Um, we provide for network IO, CPU, memory. What we do is, if, like for, as I showed for network, is that we give you controls to set limits and to set reservations. And 
the rules can be applied across different layers of the infrastructure. So you can say, I want a virtual machine or a container. That interface to have a certain absolute bandwidth or minimum, you know, a limit or a reservation. Or we can actually say on an application by application basis, right? So you can say, okay, this virtual machine is running a few applications, but, you know, the web, the traffic that's going on the web, I want it to have this policy. Or for a storage server, when, it, when this virtual machine connects to this storage server, I want there to be a minimum reservation so that it can have the right access it needs to the storage I.O. Um, so with the monitoring and the control, uh, in conjunction, we're basically able to ensure that you achieve the performance that you want for your applications. Right? So you can both monitor and detect that your applications are getting the performance they want. You can find when they're not getting the performance that, they, that, they, that you want. And you can configure to ensure that they get the performance that you want. Right now, our product is uh, in production with a few early adopters. Um, we're, we're also uh, expanding the program right now to new early adopters. So if you have use cases that you're interested in talking about, the performance problems you're seeing, uh, we would love to hear about them. Um, come visit us at our booth. We can, you know, we can talk about the scenarios you have, the use cases you have. Um, and if you're interested, maybe we can sign you up for the early adopter program. We can deploy the software in your infrastructure. You can see what's going on, getting some insight and visibility into what's happening. Um, we're at booth S4, um, so bring your scenarios down. Um, and we're a growing company, so um, if you know of, um, if you're interested in this area of work and, you know, maybe something you'd like to work on, give, definitely give us a ring. Um, and uh, I'll open up uh, any questions right now. Yeah. Oh, can you, I'm um, sorry, can you speak at the mic? They've asked me to. Actually, a quick question. Anyway, uh, where does your controller run? Is it, do you have to run it on one of the compute nodes, or is it independent of all the compute nodes, or what, is there any restrictions on that? Uh, the controller runs outside of the compute nodes. Um, you can just run it on a virtual machine, um, and you know, that's like a management, consider it like a management uh, machine that you would put in your, in your infrastructure. Um, and then we have the agent that's collecting data that runs on each compute node. Uh, I know you guys mentioned that you're all about real-time and monitoring real-time, but have you saw any use cases so far, any value in maybe collecting the aggregate data and providing dashboard and reports long-term? Or is that kind of not your forte at this point? Yeah, we, uh, we do that. I mean, we are focused on real-time, but um, again, since we publish this data, right, um, the UI is one consumer of the data that we publish, right? We also have uh, currently a listener that will store the data in MongoDB, right? And we can expand that to other kinds of um, storage, you know, if someone wants to use Cassandra or something. And the amount of data that you would want to store, that's purely up to you. So if you want to have, you know, if you have a really large infrastructure and you really want to store, you know, days worth of data, or I don't know how long, but then you want to size a MongoDB that's appropriate for that amount of data, that data rate, that size of data, and then you can, you know, so we can push that data out to, to a MongoDB that's set up and appropriately sized. Any other questions? Uh, a quick one. What is the granularity of your timing window for your real-time monitoring and control? Like you're measuring packets per second. You know, oh, yeah. What is it? What's the sampling window size? Right. Um, it varies depending on the resource. Um, for some resources, we we have a finer granularity than others, um, and that's just to kind of make sure we don't, you know, disrupt what's going on on the compute node, we don't want to have a high overhead, right? So we have to balance that precision with the overhead of the, that we impose on the system. Um, for things like network, um, we're basically at below a second uh, granularity because we're able to, again, filter what's the important data 
and, and push it up. And we were able to, like, for instance, identify, we can identify a burst that's happening at a sub-second granularity, even if we're not giving samples up to the user interface at that, at that same rate. That the ability to do that data analysis kind of distributed at the compute node itself is what allows us to be both efficient and precise. CPU. So CPU is one that right now, currently, we, we use a little bit more, like coarse grain, like one second, just because, again, the, it's, it's harder to get that information at, uh, um, without kind of putting load on the system too much. Are you using the OpenStack APIs, like Silometer or something? Um, so we, um, we don't use Silometer. Um, we have our own agent which kind of collects all the metrics that we show, push it out, and push it out, out on a dashboard. But we have an OpenStack plugin, basically, to have discover all your infrastructure. So let's say once you have deployed OpenStack, and then you deploy AppFormix, we go in there and talk to um, the NOAA client and the Neutron client and figure out all your infrastructure, like what our VMs are running, what all compute nodes do, have, do you have. So we have a discovery uh, plugin which will go and fetch all that information and then populate our controller and our database so that uh, you can see the pretty charts. Yeah, and we also, the agent after it does the discovery, it continues to listen on the uh, OpenStack message bus. So as new instances come up, then we react to that. We show them, start monitoring them. And we also, like I was mentioning earlier, you know, if you want to assign a certain network resource um, to each flavor, then you can automatically configure that at the time the, resource, the instance is created. How? Is that what the question was? How do we, okay. So using shares on the scheduler. So um, yeah. How do we do what with the network traffic? Oh, the question is how do we control the bandwidth, the network bandwidth, basically? How do we? Um, so we take an end-to-end -end approach, actually, um, where we, uh, we make sure that the sender is not sending more than what the capacity is allowed. No, we don't have to control the application. So that's a little bit of our secret sauce. And so. <laughs> But yeah, this, uh, we don't actually modify the guest or the application at all. And we do um, not drop packets as well. Right, right, So for CPU, we rely on the scheduler that's in the hypervisor itself, right? So the hypervisor is always scheduling virtual machines. And by assigning shares, you can make sure that the uh, virtual machine will not get scheduled. Um, so it's not, we're, not, we're, not actually, we're not actually stopping it ourselves. We're letting the interface that the hypervisor provides already take care of that for us. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. I'd be happy to talk to anyone else online. <laughs>